Hi everyone. After my series of posts on the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, I had been wanting to make a video about how to view what is called Jesus' Olivet Discourse, since he held it on the Mount of Olives, and there look at two verses specifically that are falsely applied to the Church in the vast majority of cases. I started to work on the video, but never found time to finish it. I did have time to do a few community posts since then, though. Those are easier for me to do. In the meantime, other channels have put out content on this topic, so some of what I had been wanting to say might be a repetition if you have watched those videos. But that's okay, because this is an important topic when it comes to so-called rapture watching, and alternative perspectives are rare. Also, I have witnessed this on prior occasions already, that the Holy Spirit orchestrates this. If he wants to highlight a certain point, he uses different vessels, often parallel to each other. And each channel owner stresses different details, so I do not believe this is going to be redundant by any means, but rather will complete a picture that others have already started to paint. What I want to focus on in this video are two key verses that are commonly misapplied by rapture watchers. Let's start with the first one. If you believe in the pre-tribulational rapture of the Church, the biblical scenario that is, I am sure you have at some point come across someone who used the following verse by giving it a specific interpretation. You can bank on it that every so-called watchman or rapture channel uses it, but you might also have come across it in the comment section. I am talking about Luke 21 verse 28. Now when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. The common interpretation, and I mean probably way over 90% of this verse is as follows. These things is interpreted to mean all kinds of current events, and also one or more of the factors Jesus mentioned in his Olivet Discourse, like earthquakes, wars, diseases, and persecution. Looking up is said to mean, be on the edge of your seat, since X and Y has happened, the rapture must be any minute. Finally, redemption here is said to refer to the rapture, with redemption meaning being delivered from this evil world. So far, the popular interpretation. But actually, none of it is correct. First, what are these things? What we need is the context, of course. The context is the following. Jesus had just predicted the destruction of the temple. The disciples asked Jesus the question, Teacher, but when will these things be? And what sign will there be when these things are about to take place? Now, in this chapter, other than in Matthew 24, Jesus actually talks about the destruction of the temple, which, from their perspective, was yet future. It happened in 70 AD. But it is a little tricky in that he does not speak about this exclusively, but only in the passage from verses 20 through 24. This passage is embedded in Jesus speaking about tribulation events, covering both signs from the beginning of Daniel's 70th week and from the very end, including his second coming. So what we have here is a ABA structure, so to speak. Regarding the prediction of the situation prior to the destruction of the temple and the event itself, I have a video on this in this series. It has the title, Woe to those who are pregnant in those days. You might want to check it out if you haven't yet. I'm not going to repeat here what I said in that video. What I do want to point out, though, is the following. In my series of posts on the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, I explained that the judgment for Jesus' generation had a double application. It was pronounced both for this age and the age to come. The judgment for the generation of Jesus' time, for having rejected both the Old Testament's testimony of the prophets and Jesus himself when he walked among them in person, is what Jesus referred to in the middle section of his answer, namely, the destruction of the temple and the dispersion of the Jews, with which event the Jewish state factually ceased to exist. This is also what he referred to when he prophesied over Jerusalem in Matthew 23 at the end of the chapter, which leads directly to him speaking about the destruction of the temple and the disciples' question in chapter 24 of Matthew. 
There, he mentions again the killing of the prophets from Abel to Zechariah, directly addressing the Pharisees by saying, whom you murdered. Then, he says, assuredly I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. At this point, the Pharisees and those who blindly followed them had already committed the unpardonable sin. Note that we have another these things here, and context is crucial when it comes to interpreting what those are referring to. Here, it means the blood of the prophets and the self-righteous attitude of the Pharisees who had claimed that if they had been living in those times, they would not have partaken in killing them. So, after Jesus said that judgment on that generation was set because they filled up the measure of their father's guilt, he prophesies over Jerusalem, saying, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her, how often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate, for, I say to you, you shall see me no more until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. He attests them their rejection and then says, Your house is left to your desolate, referring to the temple. Note that in contrast to former mentions of the temple, Jesus does no longer call the temple God's house, but their house. In chapter 21, verse 13, when Jesus overturns the tables of the money changers, he says, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. The Father's presence was no longer in it. Note also that Jesus says he made several attempts to gather Jerusalem's children. We will get back to that a little later. But let's go back to Luke 21. We already covered that in the middle part of his reply, Jesus talks about the attack on Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple. In the preceding paragraph, Jesus talks about deception, wars, earthquakes, and persecution. In the passage after the Jerusalem part, he speaks about signs in the sun, the moon, and the stars, and the second coming of Jesus. He then proceeds to talking about the fig tree and says, So you also, when you see these things happening, know that the kingdom of God is near. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all things take place. So we have three mentions of these things. First, in the question of the disciples, where it relates to the destruction of the temple. The second and the third mention of these things, verses 28 and, 20, uh, and 31, relate to what Jesus said directly prior, namely, the cataclysmic events leading directly to the second coming. Several questions must be answered here. The first, who is addressed by you here? The church age believer? No. The events leading up to the second coming of Christ will not be observed by members of the church because they won't be on earth during this time, a time which is called the time of Jacob's trouble for a reason. It is Israel who will see these signs. At this point, I would like to refer you to Petra's video on Matthew 24. She pointed something out already that I won't be repeating here, but what she said I see as well, namely, the fact that the signs that Jesus talks about parallel the seal judgments in Revelation. I will link her video in the description. Let me just briefly point out two things here. Jesus mentions wars. Yes, wars have always happened. But when he mentions wars and rumors of wars, he is specifically talking about Daniel's 70th week. Beginning with the second seal, peace is taken from the earth and there is war. The Antichrist himself will wage war, culminating in his last attempt at the end of the seven years to make war against Christ. But it is also he who will be threatened by wars, and there are rumors of wars that come to his attention. We read that in Daniel 11. The Antichrist is attacked by the king of the south and the king of the north, which is why he will entrench himself in Israel. In verse 44, we read the following. Now, some translate this tidings, news, or reports, but others, like for example the NASB, have rumors. 
I'll quote the verse from the 95 version here. But rumors from the east and from the north will disturb him, and he will go forth with great wrath to destroy and annihilate many. So during this time there will both be wars and rumors of wars. This is what Jesus is talking about. The other thing I want to mention is the term the beginning of sorrows that Jesus uses in Matthew 24. Sorrows is another expression of Jacob's trouble. The time of trouble is a very specific time period that is prophesied for Israel, not the church. We are not currently in any time period that would be called a beginning of sorrows. The sorrows, or Jacob's trouble, hasn't begun yet. The seal judgments are called the beginning of sorrows, since more rounds of judgments are to come, namely the trumpet and the bowl judgments. The severity will greatly increase after the midpoint of the tribulation when the abomination of desolation happens. So these things are the concrete judgments that will be happening in Daniel's 70th week. In both sentences that start with when these things begin to happen, Jesus points out that this means that something is near. But what is it? The rapture? No. First, your redemption, and second, the kingdom of God. Now, the kingdom of God is a future expectation for Israel. While we, the church, will be reigning with Christ during the kingdom, it is specifically Israel's promise of a literal kingdom on earth with Messiah on the throne. Regarding the term redemption, note that this is something that is a past event for members of the church. In Galatians 3, verse 13, we learn that Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, and in 1 Peter 1, verses 18 and 19, we read, Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold, from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Past tense, you were redeemed. While the rapture is referred to in Thessalonians as a deliverance from the wrath to come, it is never referred to as a redemption. But when you look into this work, what you'll find is that one of God's titles is the Redeemer of Israel. For example, Isaiah 44, verse 6, Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. So, the redemption refers to Christ redeeming Israel from the hand of their enemy. But it is also a reference to the coming of faith of the remnant, the survivors of the tribulation, and the coming into effect of the new covenant. While the redemption price has already been paid, it will effectually find its application for this generation only then, which we read in Ezekiel 36, where it talks about the fact that God will sprinkle clean water on them and cleanse them and deliver them from all their iniquity. At that time, he will also redeem the land. So, in summary, when these things begin to happen, refers to the beginning of Jacob's trouble or the beginning of sorrows. Look up is not a command for the church age believer to look for the rapture to take place, but is meant in a very literal sense. Jesus will come back visibly from heaven with his bride, the church. The Jews during that time are called to literally lift their heads and look up into the sky from where Jesus will be coming to redeem them, just as the angels had said after his ascension, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. I have already briefly referred to the use of this generation, but Let's have a closer look at this. In my series of posts on the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, or the unpardonable sin, I mentioned that Jesus, after announcing judgment on this generation, does not use the term anymore until his end times speech in Matthew 24. So the first this generation is the generation of Jews who witnessed his earthly ministry. He calls them the evil or wicked and adulterous generation. In between this and the prophecy of Daniel's 70th week, no generation is mentioned anymore. 
Why? Because in between his earthly ministry and the beginning of the tribulation is the church age, but this term is never used for the church. But let's first go to the exact questions of the disciples that are recorded in Matthew. Other than in Luke, they include the prophesied destruction of the temple, but cover more than that. And in contrast to Luke 21, in Matthew 24, the destruction of the temple is not referenced by Jesus. So the questions are as follows. Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? The these things here, again, refer to the destruction of the temple Jesus had just prophesied. The sign of your coming has nothing to do with the rapture. It is his second coming. The whole Olivet Discourse does not reference the rapture at all. It is not speaking about any church age events. The end of the age is the end of the secular empires as shown in Nebuchadnezzar's dream interpreted by Daniel. The stone cut without hands is Christ who will destroy all kingdoms of this world and establish his own everlasting kingdom. The end of this age is not referring to the church age. This is not the question of the disciples. They are asking about kingdom-related events. The church was still a mystery back then, undisclosed yet. If you go by this rule, a lot of confusion can be avoided. If you are looking for Jesus hinting at the coming church age, you must go to the upper room discourse recorded in John, not to the synoptic gospels. The content of the upper room discourse is not the topic of this video, but this is just to let you know that that's where you got to look for that. Now, in Matthew 24, starting from verse 32, we read, Now learn this parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. So you also, when you see all these things, know that it is near at the doors. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. We have already clarified who is addressed by you. It is not church-age believers. We have also already clarified what these things refers to. Not an uptick of earthquakes in our time, not current wars or signs in the heavens. In verse 15, Jesus says, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place. This is addressed to those who find themselves in the time of Jacob's trouble, and here, the specific time is the midpoint, three and a half years in. It is not the disciples who had asked the question, nor the church-age believer. I think I mentioned it in one of my videos of this Rightly Dividing series. When I was a new believer, a teenager, I read through the New Testament for the first time and came across verse 20, which reads, Pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath. I had zero clue about Rightly Dividing the Word, so I applied it to myself. Wanting to be quote-unquote obedient to the command I found there, I prayed, Lord, if I ever have to flee in my life, please let it not be in winter or on a Sabbath. I am sure God lovingly smiled at my ignorance back then. This is of course talking about the Jews who see the Antichrist put up his image in the temple in Jerusalem demanding to be worshipped. They are supposed to flee immediately. This might sound like an extreme example, and yet the principle of who is the audience addressed is discarded again a few verses later, or basically in the rest of the chapter. Regarding the fig tree, Jesus uses it at a, as a parable. In the same way the leaves show that summer is near, all the signs Jesus is talking about, the signs of the tribulation, point to the fact that Jesus' second coming is near. Where it says it is near, some manuscripts have he, so Jesus is near. This generation refers to the generation who sees all those signs that will happen in Daniel's 70th week. Jesus takes the fig tree as an example and 
It has been pointed out that the fig tree is used as a symbol for Israel in the Bible. This is not surprising because Jesus was in Israel when he spoke those words and he would have taken an example that would have been typical for there. It also underscores the Jewish nature of this time, namely the time of Jacob's trouble. Note, though, that Jesus says, learn a parable from the fig tree. This means, in the same way as the leaves of the fig tree show that summer is near, the tribulation events show that the coming of the Messiah is near. He does not say, however, the generation who sees the fig tree putting forth leaves will also see the second coming. This is how this verse is interpreted, with the fig tree putting forth leaves said to mean the founding of the state of Israel in 1948, and the generation who physically witnesses this referring to the generation who would see the rapture. The calculations have been adjusted several times already, and the length of a biblical generation as well, in order to make this fit. Now, this is a total misinterpretation of this passage of the Olivet Discourse. Jesus is not speaking to church age believers here, nor of events in the church age, like the founding of the state of Israel, nor of the rapture. And yet, this is what I believe 100% of so-called rapture watching channels claim this passage means. They call themselves the fig tree generation. I will not go in depth into the fact that the rapture is not the subject of discussion in the Olivet Discourse, but let me briefly mention a few points. It is commonly claimed that the rapture is found in the passage where Jesus talks about the ones taken and the ones left. Again, the whole context is not church-age believers and events. Besides, the immediate context helps. Directly prior to that, Jesus speaks about the times of Noah. And, by the way, I concur with Petra here as well, this isn't referring to our times either. The pattern is the remnant of Israel being kept safe in the ark during the time of Jacob's trouble. Our pattern is Enoch, who was raptured before the whole time period. But look at the verb Jesus uses here. Let's read the passage. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark, and did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Two men will be in the field, one will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill, one will be taken and the other left. First of all, it is talking about the coming of the Son of Man here, Jesus coming after the tribulation. The Son of Man is a Jewish reference to the Messiah, by the way. Now note that it says the flood came and took them all away. The being taken away here is negative, namely in judgment. In the same way, those taken in the field and at the mill are being taken or bundled up for judgment. The ones left are the ones who will enter the kingdom. At the beginning, I said I would come back again to Jesus' prophecy about Jerusalem. There, he had said that he had often wanted to gather their children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. The verb here is episunago. It is the same word that Jesus used a little earlier in verse 31 of chapter 24. And he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from the one end of heaven to the other. In Matthew 23, Jesus had said, You shall see me no more till you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. This is what the remnant is going to say at the end of Daniel's 70th week. It is a quote from Psalm 118. Then they will see him, and then they will be gathered. The elect is a term commonly used for Israel. So, the principles of interpretation of the so-called rapture channels are all wrong, which is why they come to all kinds of wrong conclusions. All those conclusions lead to the same result. A false sense of urgency is created. Look up. These things are happening. Our redemption draws near. And we are the fig tree generation. 
For this to still work, you got to be raptured by X state at the latest. It keeps you on the edge of your seat constantly and studying the development, developments of what you falsely believe these things are. It keeps your eyes off of Christ and on world events and cosmic signs. So next time you hear someone quote Luke 21 and interpret it this way, keep your peace. While we do wait for God's Son from heaven, as 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 10 says, we are not called to look up to signs that aren't for us in the first place and that we are supposedly called to watch on a daily basis. What the Thessalonians verse means is a general attitude of expectation of his coming. But we are called to run the race set before us with endurance, as Hebrews 12 admonishes us, and not out of patience and I mean running out of patience and to look unto Jesus the author and finisher of our faith and not to these things. Again we are in joyful expectation of our bridegroom who will come for us at the rapture but it is him we look unto and it is him who is our life today. Let me finish with Colossians 3, verses 2 through 4. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory.